Anthony, we are here at the Three Johns in London, in Islington, the place where it is alleged that Lenin stood up in front of the Mensheviks and instead of arguing for a peaceful resolution, argued for one that would be purely violent, a violent way to overthrow the Tsar. And this he did, we had the Russian Revolution, but just as soon as that ended, we moved through to the Civil War period, the Russian Civil War. And this was between the Reds, the Bolsheviks and the Whites. But I've always been slightly confused. Who exactly were the Whites? Well, the Whites could be basically said to be anti-Reds. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm afraid it's as um, banal <laughs> as that. But they basically consisted of three factions. There were, of course, the reactionary officers who wanted to restore Tsarism, uh, the rules of property. To, uh, it was often the very younger uh, officers who were so angry to see their inheritance, their family, um, homes and land being uh, taken away. Um, but also it was Cossacks who were the other huge thing, the Cossacks basically of southern Russia and the Caucasus, the Don Cossacks, the Kuban, Terek Cossacks down there. Um, and then of course the Siberian Cossacks who were sometimes the most reactionary and cruel of the lot. Uh, the Orenburg Cossacks, the Ussuri Cossacks, a whole range. And these were basically the sort of freebooters who had extended the uh, Russian Empire during the 19th century, advancing, advancing east and basically taking over uh, Siberia uh, as well as uh, the Central Asia. And they were the vanguards. They were the ones who protected the Russian perimeter. They were tied to the Tsar. Did they actually want to bring the Tsar back, or was it just the Tsarist way of life for them? Some of the, the rules that they lived by. I, I, yes. I, was, I remember reading that they wanted to bring back the punishments of the Tsar so that they could punch their own soldiers in the face, for example. Ah, well, no, that was much more the Tsarist officers themselves, okay. rather than the Cossacks. The Cossacks saw their way of life being threatened by the co communists. Some of them, of course, some of the younger ones, um, supported the overthrow of the Tsar. They were, you had your Red Cossacks or the uh, sort of more left-wing ones, but even they were then horrified at the way that the communists would then try to suppress uh, their way of life and, uh, and attack them because there was such a fundamental hatred really between, between the two. Um, but then the most influential, of course, were the old Tsarist officers, um, of whom, of course, there were thousands, uh, many, many thousands, and uh, uh, therefore they produced a very, shall we say, top-heavy army, because um, you had many battalions where there were just nothing but officers, so they didn't have any soldiers, or hardly any soldiers at all. Uh, so this was this sort of strange and very, uh, in many ways, incompatible alliance, the Whites, uh, and also split up geographically between um, the, what became the armed forces of southern Russia under General Tynikin in the south and the Caucasus. Uh, you had the uh, whole uh, the whites in Siberia under Admiral Kolchak, but we'll come back to him later. Um, and then you had um, a much smaller army up in the Baltic states under General Yudinich, um, really threatening Petrograd. So you had these sort of three different areas. And of course, that was a huge disadvantage to the whites because communications were so bad, they could never coordinate. Uh, and of course, the communists, uh, the Red Army, as it eventually became under Trotsky, um, had the advantage, the great advantage of interior lines, i.e. they could reinforce to their different fronts uh, from this central area uh, of Moscow and the whole of the uh, central Black Earth region. And Trotsky had one hell of a task ahead of him. He had to take this ragtag bunch of soldiers and, and turn them into what would become the formidable Red Army. Was he uniquely suited for that particular role? Well, Trotsky was brilliant in so many ways. I mean, you know, as a speaker, I mean, he could inspire um, an absolute extraordinary courage as well. Uh, amongst those he spoke to. But at the same time, uh, Trotsky wasn't always right on a strategic front, and he nearly uh, messed up the whole thing. But we'll come uh, in that when he, for example, one of the whites, and the only reason really why there was a civil war in Siberia, was that there was this Czech legion. And these were Czechoslovaks who had been split up between the German, the Austro-Hungarian, and the Russian armies during the First World War. And they managed to get yes. together at the end by crossing over the lines, surrendering to the Russians or whatever, so they could join their fellow Czechs. And they were a disciplined, well-organized bunch of 50,000 men um, 
And Trotsky became so infuriated when there were clashes. They were trying to get home along the Trans-Siberian Railway to Vladivostok, where the French ships would bring them all the way back to Europe, and then they would fight on the French side in the last stages of the First World War. Um, and um, there was a clash with some local red organisation or uh, central committee along the way. And Trotsky lost his temper and gave, sent out an order saying any Czech found with a weapon in hand will be executed. Well, that immediately uh, put the Czechs into, uh, shall we say, first of all, a defensive, but an offensive defensive role. And soon the whole of the Trans-Siberian Railway, all the way from the Volga, all the way to Vladivostok, was under their control. And so that brought in all the potential whites and the Cossacks and so forth. And suddenly there was a huge white army uh, all the way uh, across Siberia. Um, so that was a big mistake on Trotsky's part. Don't make 50,000 Czechs armed to the teeth particularly angry. Uh, yes. Yeah. You, you shouldn't, uh, I think you should calculate, you should calculate, <laughs> you should calculate. your odds um, on, uh, uh, I mean, I'm actually Napoleon's great, great, great phrase was, you know, do not interrupt the enemy when they're making a mistake. Well, you don't do the opposite when you've <laughs> got a rather more effective enemy uh, and you actually provoke them unnecessarily. Now, when it comes down to the Czechs, that's one kind of international force that is involved in this civil war. And if any history of civil war has taught us anything, it's that it's not purely a domestic fight. And so how many nations from around the world were involved in the Russian civil war? Well, I mean, the list goes on. I mean, in terms of numbers, uh, you know, British, French, American, above all Japanese, who landed nearly 80,000 men in Siberia through Vladivostok. But the Japanese, of course, had their own motives. They were a, hoping to take over a large part of uh, eastern, um, of the Far East, of the Russia Far East. Uh, later, of course, this was all part of their sort of uh, uh, Lebensraum, their sort of uh, uh, the population in Japan was uh, too large. They were therefore looking for a colony. And eventually they took over Manchukuo, or Manchuria, which yes. they called Manchukuo, instead. And the Americans sent troops to, to root them off. Well, Americans sent troops really to try to keep an eye on what was going on. Um, but Woodrow Wilson was very dubious about, quite rightly, about any uh, involvement. I mean, he warned, he warned uh, the divisional commander, uh, you know, it's going to be like stepping on explosive eggs, so uh, uh, be careful how you go. Uh, but they were basically keeping an eye on the Japanese, who had extraordinarily uh, optimistic views. I mean, uh, I quote one Japanese officer saying that soon the whole world would be speaking Japanese. You know, they really did think that they were going to sort of take over uh, the whole area. History was in their favour. It was already written in the stars. History was in their favour, exactly. Anyway, um, you had in, for example, in Murmansk and uh, Archangel, you had an allied force. But that was not part of the intervention in the, in the Civil War. They had been sent there, originally British Royal Marines, Royal Marine Light Infantry, um, because, of course, there had been huge supply depots uh, landed there um, to help the Russian armies against the Germans. Ah. And so they were defending the, those. And then, of course, there was a Finnish civil war going on with German troops in Finland very close yes. by. So they were worried that the Germans were going to get that arms depot. Exactly. Right. And that was the reason that then they were added to. There were Americans, Canadians, Italians and French. Uh, but shall we say, none of them were very enthusiastic soldiers there. I mean, there were constant mutinies, especially amongst the white Russian troops who were sort of shooting their British officers in, at night in bed. Um, I mean, it was pretty, pretty chaotic in that way. But the point was that the locals um, supported the Allied intervention because they'd been abandoned by Moscow and they had no money, they couldn't feed anybody. Uh, so the Allies were sort of welcomed, even though it was going to be disastrous for them later. Talking yeah. about the Allies, I'm assuming that as they come in here, they're coming in on the side of the Whites. Was anyone... No, not, no? Ne well, not necessarily. The, what one has to remember, of course, is, I mean, when it came down to it, you're absolutely right. But what one has to remember was, this was the end of the First World War, November 1918. The Supreme Allied Council in Paris was having to reorganise 
basically the whole world, new uh, frontiers in all directions, you know, discussing this, which they were trying to do in about two or three months. And then Woodrow Wilson in, Jul in January uh, 1919 uh, announces he's going home, but he's also said, I'm going to try and get a, uh, uh, a peace uh, settlement uh, between the whites and the reds. Well, that came to nothing, as you might imagine. Um, and this gave an opportunity to Churchill, who had just become Secretary of State for War, who was ferociously anti-Bolshevik, not, um, funny enough, on the grounds just of uh, ideology, but also because he could see that the Russian Civil War was going to destroy the food uh, for basically much of Europe, uh, which was going to lead to unrest right across Europe. Not which just which had already had a major problem because Churchill's failures at Gallipoli and the attempts to try and break through to Dardanelles had meant that global trade of grain had already ground to a halt. So this was uh, exacerbating a terrible international situation. It was. That was his sort of first reaction. But of course, he was also, as soon as they started to get information about what was coming out of Russia in terms of the Cheka, the, the tortures, the murders and all the rest of it, and the mass assassinations, uh, Churchill became even more anti-Bolshevik. Um, and of course, Clemenceau was even probably even more extremely anti-Bolshevik than Churchill. So he wanted to send both troops to fight. The British weren't sending troops to fight at that stage. Um, and also the French Navy. Now, the trouble was that we had already had the French army mutinies in 1917 after the Nivelle Offensive. And now we started to see as soon as the French troops just weren't really prepared to fight. In fact, it was the biggest humiliation. Uh, for French arms in a long time. Um, and they were literally driven off by uh, uh, Grigoriev, a red, uh, funny enough, a red Cossack Ataman in Ukraine, uh, who was one of the worst anti Semites going. And uh, uh, they then were sort of forced all the way back to Odessa and then had to be evacuated because of the chaos. And then you had the mutiny of the French fleet in the Black Sea. So uh, that wasn't, shall we say, very advantageous for French pride. Um, the British, meanwhile, were actually not uh, sending troops. They're really their own sort of fighting component was an RAF squadron, 47 Squadron RAF, um, who were very effective against Red Cavalry when they eventually appeared, you know, uh, especially around Tsaritsyn, the later Stalingrad, uh, in the fighting there. Uh, and there were a few tanks, um, you know, the old, uh, uh, the old ones from the First, First World War. So all of this equipment... Uh, artillery, tanks, uniforms, even hospitals and so forth, were all being shipped out. I mean, you know, uh, in financial terms, millions of pounds worth, even in those days. So w with all of this in mind, when it comes to the, the clash between the Reds and the Whites, mm -hmm. is it less about the Red Army's superiority and Trotsky's skills at organising and more about the ineptitude of the Whites and in fact their internal infighting as well? Um, yes, to a very large degree. But I mean, Trotsky made mistakes as well in the sense that he despised cavalry as an aristocratic pastime or whatever. But when you look at the sheer size of the Eurasian landmass, um, it was going to be a railway cavalry war, certainly in the earlier part. Um, and this is why the whites started to do really rather well, because they had the best cavalry in terms of the Cossacks. Um, and even some of the uh, white uh, um, czarist uh, units or whatever. Um, and then eventually Trotsky had to admit his mistake and start to raise red cavalry regiments um, with the uh, wonderful slogan and poster saying proletarians to horse. Um, and they did start to create uh, the first major one, in fact, of course, was Budyonny, Samyan Budyonny, who was one of uh, uh, Stalin's great uh, cronies. Um, involved, first of all, in the defence of Tsaritsyn, which is why it later became Stalingrad. That's where Stalin makes his name? That's where Stalin said. makes his name, but actually, purely through uh, total cruelty and ferocity. I mean, you know, he, he killed, I mean, a large part of the population on the grounds that he, he thought they might possibly be white spies or whatever it might be. Foreboding to what is to come. Forebodings or what is definitely what is to come. Um, but anyway, he managed to manipulate the myth quite effectively. But he did win, uh, or rather through his proxies, he did win the great strategic debate with Trotsky. Trotsky believed that the next stage, really, of 1919, um, moving into 1920, should be that the Red Army should uh, really defeat 
General Denikin in the south with the uh, white armies there uh, by attacking through eastern Ukraine and then into the Caucasus. So in this strategic debate, um, uh, Trotsky and uh, his supporters basically uh, were defeated and uh, Stalin's uh, supporters uh, won the argument uh, in uh, the Kremlin uh, that actually they needed to defeat the whites in Siberia first, Admiral Kolchak's forces. Um, of course, they had been actually advancing and like in any area where there's just so much space. It was quite often a very rapid advance, and then, my God, it was a very rapid retreat. And they were advancing towards Ekaterinburg, which is where, by then, the Reds were holding the imperial family, and nearby, other members of the imperial family, the Grand Dukes, and so forth. Right. And this is, when, this is when they said, right, we must now kill them. But Lenin was definitely in favour of killing them, because for him, it meant that the past could never come back. So they, they wanted to basically wipe out the imperial family. So as the whites are making gains, yes. and they may well liberate the Tsar and his family, yeah. they see this as a moment to literally decapitate the cause. Well, not literally. He's, he's shot with a firing squad along with his family in the basement. But the whole point here, is it to really weaken that, that white claim, that Tsarist claim to the future of Russia? Yes, and, um, but above all, I think it was to emphasize the fact that that past can never come back at all. And, um, you know, it, it was basically uh, the way that, of course, the, the Kremlin tried to pretend they had no uh, input, but actually, uh, I think recent research has shown very, very clearly uh, that the Kremlin knew very well and, in fact, had actually given the instruction to the local Soviet Get rid of them. Is it around this time that the period of Red Terror begins? Or is this happening all along? Because one thing I took from reading your book on the Russian Revolution mm -hmm. was really quite how palpably horrific it was. You, you have to have quite a strong constitution to read your, your book at certain points. I mean, there are people thrown into to furnaces yes. alive. How bad did it get? And, and when did the Red Terror begin and end? The uh, communists would argue that the Red Terror didn't start until really after uh, the attempt of Fanny Kaplan to assassinate Lenin in um, the summer of 1918. But in fact, the Red Terror really began with the institution of the Cheka in December 1917. And the Cheka were the secret police. The Cheka was the secret police, which later became the KGB um, or NKVD, KGB, etc., etc. Um, and this was going to be, it was described basically as, you know, the, the sword and shield of the revolution and so forth. Uh, the leader, Felix Dzerzinski, was totally incorruptible, but at the same time, absolutely passionate in his belief in the revolution, in the creation of Homo Sovieticus, uh, the transformation of society and all the rest of it. So, and, and what sort of methods do they employ during the Red Terror? What was their, their modus operandi? Well, in many cases, um, you know, they be, would, the definition of an enemy uh, was, of course, a class enemy. So anybody, um, in fact, they sort of said, do not ask any, don't bother to ask any questions, just ask what is their background, i.e., were they, did they come from a rich family? And soon that was even extended, of course, the kulaks, the rich peasants, uh, were even uh, then defined as, uh, soon, very soon defined as class enemies and therefore were to be killed. Or uh, we forget that it was Lenin who invented the gulag and they were sent to the uh, islands in the White Sea where most of them died uh, or starved to death. Um, as well as all those who were actually killed at the time. In fact, there were many echoes of the French, Revolu French Revolution where uh, aristos had been put into barges uh, which had then been sunk in rivers or in the sea. And they were doing this um, in uh, the Baltic uh, where they'd been, their arms were bound up with barbed wire, uh, forced into these barges and then the barges were sunk. And I'm fascinated to learn that Lenin's solution to a lot of this was the establishment of the gulags. Was that his way of bringing the, the civil war to an end? Exile them as far as possible, and then you can start to build this, this Soviet state? Uh, well, he was basically eliminate anybody who is likely to oppose the Soviet state or is likely to prove to be a saboteur or wrecker or whatever it might be. Uh, and he assumed right at the start, I mean, he even accused the bourgeoisie of um, sabotaging the food supplies. Well, I mean, the bourgeoisie had nothing to do with the food supplies. It was a question either of transport 
um, uh, which was, of course, a major problem at that stage during that particular uh, very cold winter, um, or it was a question of um, the food at origin. And, of course, they made things worse because the, uh, they sent uh, food detachments, basically were industrial workers, round the villages to seize their food so as to feed the cities. So as far as the Pleasants were concerned, they turned against the Reds um, because they saw that they were being turned into the serfs of the proletariat. And am I right in thinking they took the seed grain as well, which they meant they the couldn't grain. plant for the next year? Precisely. And this is why you had the famines. Um, and in many ways, you know, uh, Lenin had managed through these policies, and uh, especially the food policies, to turn the peasantry against them. It was just that the whites were so stupid and so reactionary um, that they were even worse. And so, um, you know, there they had an opportunity of getting a large proportion of the population on their side. And in many cases, you know, the whites or the Cossacks would ride into a town, they'd be greeted as heroes, people would even come out and kiss the stirrups of, their, uh, of the officers or whatever, in gratitude that they'd arrived, and they would be hated within three days because of rapes, of uh, stealing, of looting, and all the rest of it, and their sheer arrogance. With all of this going on, with the Tsar and his family dead, with chaos all around, and starvation afoot, and a harsh winter, how is it that the Russian Civil War comes to an end? Well, the, the, the key year, of course, was 1919, um, where, where the fighting um, towards the end of 1919, uh, which had been a tremendous white advance on Moscow. I mean, they'd managed to get all the way to within, you know, a couple of hundred miles of Moscow. And they, um, there were even rumours that the, the Bolsheviks were uh, abandoning the capital and all the rest of it. Um, and Churchill was getting really excited, thinking, you know, this is going to be it and then couldn't understand why there was a sudden turnaround. And this was partly because the armies which had been used against Siberia and had defeated Admiral Kolchak could now be brought back uh, and suddenly started to reinforce the, the Red Army there. But also because the Reds were very much more intelligent than the Whites, they offered an amnesty to all the deserters. Right. Um, and suddenly there was another half million joining the Red Army. Um, so the Whites suddenly were pushed all the way back to the south, uh, partly in, uh, some of them into the Crimea, but most of them back into the Caucasus. And of course it's from Crimea they're pushed even further and they have to evacuate to, to Turkey. Well, the, yeah, exactly, but that's not until October, right. uh, November 1920. But in the meantime, and this is again the great stupidity of the Whites, in the meantime, there is the Russian-Polish War. And the Whites, because of their reactionary Russian imperialist idea, ideas, um, refuse to offer any, in, any encouragement uh, to independence in any case. They said basically to the Poles, you know, you actually should still be part of the Russian Empire. Um, so Plusudski, their leader, had very little faith in them at all. Ditto with Estonia, which had been part of the Russian Empire and the Baltic states, and ditto with Finland. And that is why the fin white Finns uh, managed to win their civil war, OK, with German help during the first part of 1918. So having sort of really irritated and exasperated all of those people who, with whom they could have uh, uh, had a, quite an effective alliance. Um, here they were uh, more or less abandoned in, um, in the Crimea, now under the command of General Baron Wrangel, who was a very effective and, uh, uh, commander, and especially a cavalry commander, uh, and General Denikin had gone off into exile. But the Poles probably wouldn't like the idea that their war against the Bolsheviks, which they regarded as one of the great decisive battles of the world, and to a large degree was. Um, this was at this moment of over-optimism on the part of the uh, Bolshevik of the communist government in, in Moscow that they were about to break open the whole of Europe and create world revolution. Well, actually, the German revolution had already failed uh, but they still thought if we can get through, if we can get through Poland, through white Poland, um, you know, we can sort of stir it all up again. And so um, in the summer of 1920, as they advanced uh, south of uh, East Prussia uh, and um, were advancing on Warsaw, uh, 
Um, they underestimated the way that the Poles, especially with their cavalry, had actually taken a very dangerous but brilliant uh, strategic gamble uh, of swinging all the way out and then attacking them from the flank. Um, and this caused total destruction. Uh, and really humiliation and the defeat of the Red Army there. And in the south, you had Stalin uh, with the other Red Army who refused to come to the help of General Tukhachevsky, who was a very young but brilliant commander in the north. And this was led to, shall we say, eventually to Tukhachevsky being executed by Stalin uh, later on during the 1930s. Surprise, surprise. You yeah, know. of course. Uh, because Stalin had been blamed, not surprisingly, uh, for the defeat in, against the Poles. And it's from here that the civil war starts to come to an end. The whites are, are not very canny at diplomacy. They, are, they, they sow the seeds of their own undoing. Absolutely. And you have the, the rise of the Bolsheviks and, and the start of, of, of the Soviet, really. This, this period of time that, of, of, of course, defines so much of the 20th century. Now, one thing that the Russian army is notorious for is their brutality, something which we're seeing around the world today with Russia's offensive war in Ukraine. Is this something that you see as a legacy from that period, something that is formed out of the Russian Civil War? A lot of people would say it goes much further back. It even goes back to the Mongol invasions of the 13th century, uh, the feeling that the world is against them and that uh, uh, basically that rape, destruction, massacre of civilians is a natural weapon of war. And I think in the West, although we had the horrors of the wars of religion in the 17th century and all the rest of it, uh, there was uh, an enlightenment afterwards and a, a growth in the view of humanism and so forth, um, which never really took place in Russia. Um, and, you know, whether it's the expansion of the Russian Empire, uh, the cruelty there was still pretty horrific, especially into the Caucasus and even into Iran, uh, or Persia as it was in those days. Um, what we see, therefore, is although the, the First World War was fought much more under the conditions of the Germans and the Austro-Hungarians, um, but the Russian Civil War reverted very much um, to watch Pushkin referred to as Russian revolt, merciless and senseless. Um, and uh, there we do see uh, this, the, this reversion to the idea um, that cruelty was almost essential if you were going to win uh, the battle. To certainly on both sides, I think on the uh, side of the Reds, particularly because of the Cheka, uh, it was worse. But I mean, the whites, uh, were especially the Cossacks, you know, the way they were using their sabers would sort of hack people to pieces while they were still alive and all the rest of it. But we don't need to go into that anymore. But um, what we then see, of course, is the Second World War, where the Red Army, having, and many of them have felt humiliated by their own leaders and by their own political officers, and the way they were forced to crawl out into no man's land to strip their own dead of their uniforms so that they could be reused elsewhere. Um, we're seeing similar things in sort of Ukraine. Again, we're seeing the rapes, we're seeing the destruction, the killing of, un totally unnecessary killing of civilians. All of these things again. But again, there is this element of the way that they, their recruits and conscripts are being completely uh, uh, humiliated or have been and why they are taking it out on the victims. I mean, I remember in Russia in the, in the 90s, in the early 90s, I mean, there were up to 5,000 conscripts a year committing suicide because of their way that they were uh, tortured, hazed, uh, whatever you want to call it, on joining the Russian army. One of the highest suicide rates in the world. One of the highest suicide rates in the world, absolutely. So we do see, and it's really one of the explanations, that sort of it's become something that seems to be so natural to the uh, Russian military mentality um, that they often treat their own people just as badly as they treat their enemies. Um, and that is why one sort of fears for a disintegration of the Russian army, or even though one hopes for it in a way, it's the best way of ending the war in Ukraine, but also to what degree that that will then lead to some sort of cruel and brutal disintegration of Russia itself, which would be a terrible humanitarian disaster. And yet, as I say, it's probably the only way that we will see the end of the war in Ukraine. But Crimea, 
Crimea is going to be the central question. And it is fascinating, isn't it, how these same strategic choke points appear time and time again yes. throughout history. The Russian Civil War, the British in Crimea, yes. and Crimea and Ukraine again today. Anthony, thank you so much for your time. You've taken us, well, from this room where Lenin allegedly started the, the, the violent side of the yes. Russian Revolution all the way through that Russian Civil War, taking us to, well, really outlining how its legacies affect us today. Thank you for your time. Not at all. Thank you. Thanks for watching this video on the History Hit YouTube channel. You can subscribe right here to make sure you don't miss any of our great films that are coming out. Or if you are a true history fan, check out our special dedicated history channel, historyhit.tv. You're going to love it.